Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, December the 20th, 2020, the Sunday before Christmas, and I hope that you have had a great week. If you live anywhere in West Virginia, Maryland, or Pennsylvania in the surrounding morning, area of us, um, <laughs> if you heard that, that's Tammy over there with her computer, and she was doing a little bit of echo of what I got going on here. Oh, by the way, if you hear anybody crunching on some Christmas cookie, it'll be her over there snacking a little bit and everything, and I'll pay for that one later. You can guarantee that, but uh, give you a little bit of laughter this morning, even though she is trying to uh, probably a little bit red-faced over there. But uh, it is good to have you with us this morning. I hope that you've enjoyed the snow this week. Uh, yes, uh, for Tammy and I, that's the, the most snow that we have seen in quite a while. And uh, got out and, and enjoyed it a little bit. Didn't do a snowman, didn't do new sled riding like I know some of you did. Um, and uh, But uh, maybe the next snow, when it comes around, we'll be able to get out and enjoy it. Did take some pictures and uh, got some beautiful uh, sights of everything that was happening. And we're very thankful for the beautiful world that God has and that he accentuates with the snow and uh, everything that uh, became a part of that. Again, hope you've had a great week. I think we've got a great message here this morning, both in song as well as from God's Word. And I would encourage you right now, I'll probably say it again later, but uh, go ahead and if you would, share this message with other people. You can share it on your timeline, make it public, or do a watch party, share it with somebody that you think would benefit from it and would receive encouragement from it. Uh, this is a great way for us to be able to share the message of Jesus Christ on this Sunday before Christmas uh, that uh, gives encouragement and hope. And if you uh, you're like me, you know that there are a lot of people around us that can use a lot of encouragement and hope right now, and this is a means for you to be able to provide that for them. There right before, uh, if you're on our Facebook page, um, right below where you're seeing this, potentially, uh, are the songs that we're going to do this morning, the words of the songs that we're going to do this morning, and I'd encourage you to join with me this morning. Sing out nice and long and and loud um, I don't, you know, I want you to drown me out this morning. I don't sing because I have a good voice. I sing as a, as a praise to the Lord, and I encourage you to do the same as we sing some of our favorite Christ, Christmas songs this morning. We're going to start out with Joy to the World, just two verses of it. Here we go. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. He rules the world with truth and grace. And makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Well, I'd say that's great singing if I could hear you through the computer, but uh, lifting up your voices to the Lord, and that you will continue to do so each and every day, not just here on Sunday, to worship Him, because He is worthy of worship every day. Everything that we have to offer, um, let's lift it up to Him. I want to share with you several announcements this morning, very quickly, in order that uh, we can all be aware of uh, some things that are going on. One, I, for those of you that are part of our church family, I would encourage you to continue to be faithful in your tithes and offerings. You can mail those into the church and uh, get that taken care of. Church address is 18,800 Middle Ridge Road in Rawlings, Maryland. So I thank you for your faithfulness in that and encourage you to continue in that as well. If you did not see a little while ago or don't remember, uh, go ahead and share this message with other people. Uh, the more that we can get involved in that, the uh, wider our audience will be. I care not 
if people know my name or see my face. That is not why I ask you to share the services. I ask you to share them because people need to know about Jesus. His is the face that they will one day stand before. And if they have made the right decision in relation to him, to, to him and, have a, and, and have him as Savior and Lord, then that will be a great day. And you can help to make sure that that happens uh, by sharing this message with them. Uh, start a watch party, do whatever it is you can, invite people to come and participate with us. I'd also ask you to put a comment uh, along with this post that is an encouragement to me. It is also an encouragement to other people as they see you uh, participating in the service, and this is one way that you can participate, uh, that would be a great encouragement all the way around. For the last uh, several weeks, we have been doing uh, evening Bible studies at 5 o'clock, Tuesday through Thursday usually. We will not have those this week uh, due to it being uh, Christmas week and such. So uh, we'll get back to those at the beginning of the year, depending upon uh, when we actually go back to live and in-person services. But close to that is that we will be having an in-person service this week. It will be on Thursday, which is Christmas Eve. And we will have a service at the church in the parking lot. Or you say, well, it's going to be cold. Well, it is, but you'll be able to do it there in the parking lot in your vehicles. Um, and uh, we will uh, have a sound system set up outside, as well as you will be able to hear the broadcast uh, via the radio uh, into your vehicles. Uh, we will also be doing communion, um, give you an opportunity for those that are interested to get out of your cars and sing some Christmas carols together so we can see, hear each other's voices, uh, maybe even have some hot chocolate that night. So would encourage you to be there uh, Thursday at 5 o'clock, for the Christmas Eve service. There's a posting about that on our Facebook page, an event posting. And if you could go ahead and click your intention of being there, uh, that would be very helpful in the planning for that service this coming Thursday night. We'll be singing together. We'll have a short message. We'll be participating in communion together. So I would encourage you to be there and to invite others to come and participate with us as well. Now, I also want to let you know that uh, my family and I are planning to get away for a few days, so we will not be with you next Sunday morning, at least not live anyway. Uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, taping, a or recording, taping's old word, but recording um, the music and announcements and prayer requests with you. And then, right after that, uh, Levi Hartsock, who is Jeff and Terry's um, son-in-law, is going to be delivering the Masses live next Sunday morning. So go ahead and be looking for the post at 1045 next Sunday morning that, will, that should post right at that time and follow that. And then immediately after that, Levi will come back on live and will present the message for us. So looking forward to that. I have not heard Levi speak before. But uh, I'm looking forward to being able to participate with you in that, even if it is that I see it recorded, but still uh, looking forward to being able to enjoy that. Well, let's take an opportunity to sing once again. Once, once again, our, the words for our songs are on our Facebook page. And we're going to sing, Oh, come all you faithful. God has been faithful to us. He asked us to be faithful to him here at Christmas but also all the year through, faithful in our worship, faithful in our obedience, faithful in our giving, faithful in just living a life according to God's standards and according to his will. Let's sing together this morning, O come, all you faithful. O come, all ye... That didn't go so good. Trying to get the tune in my head. It's not as easy as you think all the time. Oh, come, ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, 
Born the King of angels, O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet Thee. Born this happy morning, Jesus, to Thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, O oh, come, let us adore Him. O oh, come, let us adore Him. O oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. We're going to take some time now to uh, uh, spend some time in prayer together this morning. And I plan to send out to those of you that have an email address for, I plan to send out the uh, uh, church prayer list this week so that you can uh, be reminded of those things that have been put before us. And right, even right now, if you could, if you have a prayer request or if you just have a need on your heart that you don't want to share the specifics of, then you can use the uh, comment section or uh, Instant Messenger to be able to share those with us. Uh, whichever one, you can just say prayers, please, and we will lift that up, or it can be more specific in the needs of your heart or the needs of your family, and we will uh, bring those before the Lord, whether it be in just a moment or whether it be in the days ahead. Obviously, uh, COVID has, is wreaking havoc in our world, wreaking havoc in families and in churches, and uh, we need to be in prayer concerning those. If you have a COVID need, personally or in the life of your family or, or friends, go ahead and post that and, and let us know about that. We'll be praying about that. Uh, but many have uh, succumbed to that disease. And one of those that uh, that happened for this week was Sam Beiser. Uh, many of you that are watching right now are uh, familiar with the Beiser family, uh, been in this community for a long, long time, and have been Im impacting this community for a very long time as well. So please be in prayer for the Beiser family as well as for Sam Beiser's church family as he was a pastor. And uh, for that church now, uh, they're without their leader, they're without their shepherd. And so please be in prayer for them as they, uh, in the days ahead, will be going through that process of discovering God's man for, to lead that church uh, for the days ahead. Um, also, I was uh, uh, Joe called me this morning and told me about another uh, family that is going through a very trying time right now. Family of Norman Larue, uh, his family has been notified that he probably does not have many days left on Earth, and uh, they have been called down. He's in the hospital in Morgantown. So please uh, be in prayer for them. If anyone has uh, a desire to reach out and minister kindness. Uh, during this Christmas season, I know a family that could use some help with some Christmas gifts, three young children in that family. And if you would like more information about that, just let me know and I can get uh, some information to you about how you could be a part of their Christmas and being a blessing to them. As well as I know of a couple that is in need of a temporary place to stay. Again, if you would be interested in that and available for that, uh, please contact me and we can uh, give you some details on that as well. Be in prayer for our medical personnel, our uh, school personnel, and all the stresses that that is putting on everybody that is involved in those different processes and, and everybody that uh, is a part of those groups as well as many others. Uh, be kind to one another during this time. Uh, this is wearing on all of us. This is not something that just one person is dealing with. Uh, we are all in the same storm, as somebody said, but we're not all in the same boat. And some are able, some are in a bigger boat, a yacht or whatever else. Some are in a canoe and about to capsize. So be in prayer for each other. Be, be patient with one another. Give grace to one another uh, during these difficult days. And definitely be in prayer for each other as 
we face these days together. Know that you are not alone, not just with other people around you, but know that God is with you in the midst of the difficulties that you face. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we bow in your presence, and we thank you so much that we are not alone. We do not always feel your presence. That's a reality. But we know by faith that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that just as you've been with us in the good times, you're with us in the difficult times as well. Quite honestly, we wish the difficult times did not come. But we know, Father, that you use those difficult times to shape us, to grow us, and to remind us of our absolute dependence on you. We know, Father, that you use even the negative times to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. I know, Father, from, from personal testimony that there are people that are receiving Jesus Christ as a Savior in the hospitals even just short time before they breathe their last breath, Father. And so I thank you. I praise you. And I trust you. We bring before you many needs in our hearts. The people that are listening now, the people that will listen later. Many things in our hearts. Some of it has to do with COVID. Some of it has to do with things totally different from that. Jobs, finances, um, different difficulties that people are facing. Give them strength. Not in their flesh, but in you. Lift them up, I pray. Cause them to reach out to you. And to realize, to come to understand, maybe for the first time, that you are the only source of strength that they need or that is able to support them in life struggles. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to sing one more song with you this morning. Not to you. Did you catch that? Not to you. With you. And once again, it is there on our Facebook page. Go tell it on the mountain. It celebrates... The good news of Jesus Christ. And it tells us what to do. I mean, here we are. If you live in our area, you live in the mountains. So tell it on the mountain. Proclaim it from every hill that Jesus Christ is born. Let's sing together this morning. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born the shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that jesus christ is uh, that hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, our humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation, thou blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, I encourage you to take it and open it to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. As you turn there, I want to pose a question to you. What word would you use to describe 2020? Now, some might be tempted to uh, use some of the uh, and a word that might 
we might consider to be inappropriate on this podcast or any other broadcast. That might be the first word that comes to your mind. Hope not, but it might very well be. While there have been some positives that have happened this year, I mean, there have been babies born, both physical and spiritual, as far as people getting saved this year, and some been some goals achieved as well, most would describe this year in relatively negative terms. Words like scary, confusing, lonely, separated, depressing, loss, anger, sadness. All of those words are appropriate. Among the many descriptors that we could use, personally, I would choose to use the word noisy to describe this year. Let me explain. In January, we started to hear minor rumblings about something going on halfway around the world. Wuhan, a city in China, was experiencing an outbreak of a disease that what appeared to be just a new form of the flu. I, like most people, had never heard of Wuhan. I originally thought it to be a small village out in the countryside. <laughs> Imagine my surprise when I found out that it was a city of 11 million people. Few in the Americas thought that what was happening there was going to be a threat for us. The few that sounded the alarm were labeled as alarmists. Their voices were quiet enough for us to stifle at first. But then the noise generated by health professionals steadily grew as the cases of COVID-19 multiplied. The federal, state, and local governments reluctantly initiated lockdowns as a means of slowing the virus's spread. The result was that everything quickly grew quiet. For only the second time in our history since their invention, airplanes did not cross the sky. Pictures of normally crowded interstates showed them to be void of traffic. Our church, like most others, locked its doors and went to an online-only ministry model. Streaming our services had been a part of our plan for 2020, and though there were some hiccups along the way, it was fun at first. I liked the little uh, thumbs up and heart, sim and heart symbols that floated across the screen, but they were and still are a poor substitute for the faces that I long to see. Doing church in the spring with just Tammy, Corey, and me in the church building was weird and quiet. About the only place at the beginning of the pandemic that you go to find people was in the grocery store. Even that was unusually hushed as people no longer engaged in even polite conversation due to one-way aisles, masks, and the threat of contamination. If you wanted to find noise, you had to go to either the paper, paper goods aisle or the meat counter where people were either fighting over the limited supply or rejoicing over their good fortune. The truck had just arrived with a treasure that everyone sought. <laughs> what was it? Yeah, that's right, toilet paper. And then in May, when the actions of a four, uh, four police officers led to the death of a man, the silence gave way to a thunderous outcry. That event, mixed with the death of several more people, led to riots in our cities. Like a boisterous, impromptu protest recorded in Scripture, some did not even know why they were there. They had just had some pent-up steam that they needed to release, and throwing a rock through a store window seemed just as good an outlet for their anger as any other. Between President Trump's tweets and Dr. Fauci's briefings, the noise was both deafening and confusing. There was no unified message. Our own governor here in Maryland showed his level of frustration over people's failure to listen when he said these now famous words, just wear the mm, masks. So many people were talking, shouting in fact, even though few were listening. Political ads and jabs led to presidential debates that were anything but presidential. Posts on Facebook about how to stay safe were followed by others that pushed one conspiracy theory after another. Questions linger about who the country actually elected as their next president 
and about the risks a hurried vaccine brings. The noise generated by this year's events threatened to deafen us and harden us to the weeping prompted by so much loss. When life gets complex and noisy like it has been this year, it is comforting to focus on thoughts, on our thoughts on simpler, quieter times. The significant snow that we got this week in our area helped to return some hush to our world long enough to hear the insatiable laughter of children. Christmas classics such as It's a Wonderful Life remind us of what's important. That message often requires a heavenly messenger just as it did in that movie. For some of you, movies from that era are a relatively accurate picture of what life was like when you grew up. For others, the character, setting, and approach to life that that movie portrays is ancient, but it's not nearly so ancient nor so calming as the first Christmas story. As uh, This morning, um, as we're going along, we're going to take a look at that Christmas story and what it's all about. As noisy as our year has been, I think it relatively silent compared to the crescendo produced by the events surrounding Jesus' birth. That noise was short-lived, and it was both beautiful and deafening. It interrupted the plans and the movements of those who heard it. Not everyone heard all the sounds, but those who did asked this question, Do you hear what I hear? This morning I ask you to join me as we listen to the many voices that harmoniously told the first Christmas story. As is the case with most Christmas choir harmonies, there were four parts. One of the voices belonged to the government, and the government spoke demanding control. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. It says this, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. If you thought that governmental overreach was something new, then you missed this part of the Christmas story. Governments have always worked to control their people. That is most true of those administrations that think little of their citizens, fear losing power, and want to siphon the kingdom resources to their own pet projects. Depending on your Bible translation, the purpose for Caesar's command was either to conduct a census or to make sure that everyone was properly taxed. Both interpretations are accurate. The taxes required from each territory were likely dependent on the population count. Conversely, the primary purpose of the census our government just finished is to establish representation in the House of Representatives and to redraw the boundaries of, the di of their districts. Ours is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, supposedly. Rome's was not. They did not lead through representation. They ruled through what they believed to be divine right. They did so through their military and through taxes. The first kept the common folk in fear. The other kept them poor. The Israelites, of whom Joseph and Mary were a part, detested the government they lived under. They would have done so whether that government was just or not. The Israeli people resisted being told what to do. They wanted the right to determine their own destiny. Under Rome, they were indeed no freedoms and no rights. There were those who worked to destabilize the Roman government and rid Israel of Caesar's influence. People called this group the Zealots. They were zealous to return control of Israel's land back to Israel's people. Does any of this sound familiar to what we are facing in our country? Barring a stunning series of events, Joe Biden will become the next president of the United States on January 20th, 2021. That fact creates a great deal of anxiety for about half the country. My personal level of concern is growing as I hear the names and history of those that Joe Biden, Joe Biden is appointing for positions of leadership in his administration. 
the likelihood of an increase in your taxes is the least of your concerns. Now, there is nothing wrong with the government requiring financial support. Caesar Augustus was an evil man, but not because he worked to register people and cut off their means of evading taxes. If Joe Biden leads Congress to raise taxes, that might make him foolish, but it will not justify labeling him as evil. Other actions, however, might. Whether it be Rome's government or ours, each likes to think that his voice is the loudest and that it will be followed without question. So how are we as Christians supposed to respond to a Joe Biden, Kamala Harris administration? The same way that Joseph did. He obeyed. If anyone had an excuse of why he should not have to obey the government's edict, Joseph did. His wife was due to deliver their first child any day. Surely that qualified for an exemption or at least a delay. Still, Joseph obeyed. It was not until several decades later that the Apostle Paul wrote the following from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. And then verse 7, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. As we anticipate the incoming administration, I have heard some Christians saying things like this. Why should I give honor to Joe Biden? He got to the Oval Office through illegitimate means. Even if that is true, it does not compare to the method of succession that the Roman Empire would use. Caesar Augustus' dad, Julius Caesar, famously lost the throne and his life when members of the Roman Senate stabbed him 23 times. <laughs> I found out this week that about 20% of the 82 emperors in the Roman Empire died by assassination, leaving their firstborn or some other powerful official to take control. That would leave the empire with an unknown. They had no idea what kind of ruler they were getting. Was life about to get better or worse? The person with ultimate political power, greater power than any U.S. president ever had, might have been a skilled, legitimate successor to the throne, and he might have been a childish fool. All the Caesars, all the Roman em emperors were evil. Some were more evil than others. But God required that his people give respect and submission to the Roman emperor regardless of what they thought of him. I have also heard some, some Christians argue this way. Well, when Donald Trump came into office, his opponents refused to recognize his legitimacy, boycotted his inauguration, tore up his State of the Union speech, and worked tirelessly to get him convicted of a crime against the country. They said, not my president, it's our turn now. We're, we're just going to give back to them what they give to us. <laughs> oh, really? Does that sound mature? More importantly, does that fit with Scripture? Jesus said to love your enemies. He said that if someone compels you to go a mile, you should offer to go a second one for free. And when Jesus said those words, he was speaking of the requirement that any Roman soldier could make of a citizen to carry his pack for one mile. Jesus told Christians to obey, as well, but he also told them to give more than was required. He said that we are to be salt and light. That means that we're supposed to make a difference. How can we make a difference if we are not different. Do not get me wrong. I voted for Donald Trump. I am not backing Joe Biden. But I am backing a Christian response to him as well as respect for the office of the President of the United States. When Joe Biden or his administration do something evil and I feel the prompting by the Holy Spirit to say something about it, I will. 
And if government officials, whoever they might be, tell us that we, may, we must keep our church doors closed for an indefinite period of time without a justification that our church leadership agrees with, we will disobey and deal with whatever consequences may come. But we will still give respect. And we will still obey those commands that do not conflict with God's revealed truth. Joseph and Mary obeyed Caesar Augustus. They traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem. As difficult as that journey was, and as much as Joseph may have chafed under the requirement to take his overly pregnant wife on that journey, the government's requirement enabled the arrival of Jesus in Bethlehem exactly as it had been prophesied. And it's just outside Bethlehem that we hear the next voices speak. They were angelic, and they spoke, offering hope. Look at Luke chapter 2 once again, beginning with verse 8. It says this, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace goodwill toward men. Now, even if you've never read the Bible, those words should sound familiar to you. You have heard them before. Linus quoted them as the answer to a question first posed by Charlie Brown and subsequently repeated by millions since then. The Charlie Brown Christmas may be another one of those Christmas specials that is fading in its exposure, so let me give you a quick summary. As the story begins, Charlie Brown wonders what, why the approach of Christmas leaves him so depressed and what Christmas is all about. Everyone around him has their own ideas. To his dog, Snoopy, it's about winning a decoration contest. His little sister, Sally, believes that Christmas means Santa Claus and the gifts that he will bring. In fact, most of the characters agree with this ass assessment. When Charlie Brown expresses his concerns to his high-priced psychologist, who happens to be Lucy, she suggests that an activity will help to get his mind off of these questions. She says that a Christmas play is the thing they need. Some coaxing leads to agreement from the gang, but everyone has their own idea what the play should look like. Lucy thinks that she should be the, top, the star of the play, and that Jingle Bells should be the primary musical number. Linus refuses to give up his blanket and chooses instead to shape it into a shepherd's headdress. Frida mentions her naturally curly hair in every line of the script. As is the case with many first practices for dramatic productions, chaos ensues. Instead of listening to Charlie Brown, the appointed director, the cast dances furiously to Schroeder's piano playing. A frustrated Charlie Brown believes that a Christmas tree will help to put them in the Christmas spirit. So he and his best friend Linus go in search of one. After walking past all the fancy aluminum trees for sale, he finds what he believes to be the perfect tree. It is a puny pine tree whose needles fall when Charlie Brown lifts it from the ground. Linus warns that this tree will probably not meet the group's expectation. He was right. After attacking the tree, Charlie Brown's friends attacked him for being so stupid to think that they would be pleased. His friend's reaction to his choice of a tree increased his frustration and the intensity of his quest for an answer. So he blurted out, isn't there anyone who knows what the true meaning of Christmas is? And that is when Linus steps into the spotlight to quote the passage we read a few moments ago. I think that there's a reason why this story is so endearing to so many people. That reason has nothing to do with the quality of the production. 
The animation is childish by most people's standards today. There are parts that drag on way too long. Though the music now reminds you of Christmas, very few recognizable Christmas songs are included. No, the reason we love this story is because the one role that is played by two characters, the Christmas tree and Charlie Brown. Many, if not most of us, can identify with their plight, trying to gain approval by living up to everyone else's expectations, miserably failing at every turn, constantly being passed over, desperately seeking someone to wrap us with love, rejoicing when it finally happens. The shepherds knew the emotions that Charlie Brown felt. Theirs was a profession that most looked down on. They smelled like sheep. Few wanted to be around them. But who they were, what they did, and what others thought did not deter the angels from delivering God's message first to them. First one and then a multitude, perhaps millions, gave the true meaning of Christmas. Contrary to the song Hark the Herald Angels Sing, the angels did not sing their message, they shouted it. This night is about Jesus. It's about the hope that he provides. The sky was ablaze with the light of God's glory. The angels came at night, and the darkness of that night is echoed in our circumstances right now. The future that society anticipated was bleak, and you may think the same about yours. But the babe in the manger changes everything. Just as he did for Charlie Brown and his tree, Jesus provides hope in the form of acceptance, beautification, and forgiveness. He gives strength to the weak, joy to the sorrowful, meaning to the purposeless, and direction to the lost. He gives hope. This is the message that Jesus gives today and that the shepherds heard that glorious night. Can you imagine the fear and amazement that the shepherds experienced? Their silent night was interrupted by brilliant light, majestic company, and a hopeful message. Of all the things that the shepherds heard from the angels that night, the phrase that most piqued their interest is the one that required them to act. The angel said, you will find the babe. It took a moment for the shepherds to process the angel's words, but when they did, a smile crossed their face. The angel's message suddenly became personal. You will find the babe, the angel said. That sounded to the shepherds like an invitation. They chose to act on it. Look at Luke 2, 15 and 16. It says, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into Bethlehem that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. The shepherds addressed their first words to one another. That prompted them to make a hastily arranged trip to Bethlehem. Luke, the author of this story, left out some of the details that we might like to know. Things like, what did the shepherds do with the sheep? Did they leave them out in the fields under the watchful eye of the angels? Or did they drive them through the streets of town? Did all the shepherds go? Or did they draw straws to determine who would stay behind? Those are the kind of questions and arrangements that might normally stifle an impetuous idea and cause cooler heads to prevail. Thankfully, the angel's announcement provoked so much excitement and curiosity in the shepherds that they pushed all practical concerns aside. Boy, were they ever glad that they did. The shepherds came, they saw, and they rejoiced. We will speak more of the scene that the shepherds beheld in a moment. For now, I want, to, I want us to focus on their return trip back to the fields. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, and then verse 20. It says this, Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Then the shepherds returned 
glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. I always try to envision how what I read in the Bible actually happened. What did this event look like? Did the same shepherds who tried to keep their sheep quiet on the way to Jesus shout at the top of their lungs as they returned from Jesus? Did they bang on the door of every house that they passed and say, Wake up! What are you doing sleeping? Don't you know that Christ the Lord was born tonight? He's just a few hundred feet down from your door. You don't want to miss him. Just as their night had been inter interrupted by the angels, so they interrupted the sleep of every home they passed. Their actions were not about retaliation. They simply wanted to share their joy. The hope that Jesus brings was not something then and is still not something today to be kept a secret. They continued their message that they had received from a heavenly source. Not everyone received their words favorably, but they caused quite a stir. Did anyone other than the shepherds come to faith in Jesus Christ that night? Was anyone's heart washed by Jesus' blood so that they were now whiter than snow? No. The words the shepherds shouted that night altered no one's eternal destiny. Not by themselves, anyway. However, the shepherds' excitement, their audacity, their unbridled joy caused people to wonder. Their words got people thinking. They provoked curiosity among the people in the homes around the manger where Jesus rested. And who knows how many eventually responded with a saving encounter. Most of you listening to me right now know Jesus as your Savior. Something someone said or did piqued your curiosity about Jesus, which led you to take him as your Savior and friend. What was it? What did you see in someone else's life that made you want to know more? Maybe it was their stability when facing crisis, their joy that nothing could shake, their confidence in the promises of God, their willingness, willingness to help no matter the task, their kindness that never sought a reward, or their lack of fear in the face of death. You may have been a follower of Jesus for an exceptionally long time. You have been in love with Jesus for so many years that you may have trouble remembering what it was that originally drew you to him. So consider this. What is it that the world is most seeking? What of that need can Jesus most satisfy? Those are the actions and attitudes that you need to build in your life so that you will naturally attract others to Jesus. Does how you live your life provoke curiosity about Jesus and someone else's life? Does what you say wake them from their sleep and point them to the Savior that they otherwise might have missed. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 is Paul's testimony. He said, I believed, therefore I have spoken. If you believe something, you tell someone else about it in such a way that shows that you want them to believe it too. Pique a friend, neighbor, or family member's curiosity about Jesus through your words and actions just as someone else did for you. Something piqued your curiosity about church too, and you came. What you found kept, kept you coming back for more. Remember what it was when you once again have the opportunity to walk through our church doors. You all know that it has been a rough year for church attendance. From March 15th to June 7th of this year, our church sat virtually empty. The only ones there for those weeks were those necessary for leading the service. Our first Sunday back to in-person services saw 25 people in attendance, which is about half of our normal pre-COVID crowd. Those returning to worship in the building increased each week over the next months. We even added some people during that time frame, which got us back to our numbers that we had before COVID entered our vocabulary. Once again, we have temporarily closed our doors. 
This is the second time this year that we've been out of church for a prolonged time, and we do not know how long it will be this time. No government entity forced us to close. We chose this action to help keep everyone safe. We are waiting for the infection rates to go down before we do in-person church again. Online church prevents one type of risk, but it heightens another one. You might get comfortable doing church this way. After all, your sofa is far easier on your back and your backside than the seating at church. Doing church from home saves you from the sting of winter's cold wind and gets you to dinner so much faster. If Sunday morning does not work for you, then you can tune into the recorded version at your convenience. You can worship with coffee in your hand, slippers on your feet, and a fire in the stove. You hear yourself saying, I could get used to this. It is that fire in the stove that illustrates one of the reasons why it is important for you to participate in person when that option is available to you again. A pastor went to the home where one of his families lived. The husband was reticent to come to the church, expressing his question as to why it was necessary for him to come there when he could worship on his own privately. Why did he need the company of others at church, he wondered. The husband was sitting in his living room when the pastor got there. Without saying a word, the pastor went to the wood stove, pulled out a red hot coal with the tongs, and laid it on the hearth. Before long, that coal grew cold and black. The pastor then placed the coal back in the stove next to the other glowing coals. It soon, soon glowed with the same heat that the other coals possessed. The two men exchanged a glance, but no words passed between them. The pastor left. You guessed it. The next Sunday, the man was in church. Sometimes the best way to get your point across is to not even speak at all. That gets us to the final set of voices in the Christmas story. The only voices that spoke not a word. The family of Jesus did not speak at all. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. It says, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. As I said earlier, Joseph could have petitioned the government to let him stay in Nazareth. He could have also protested the innkeeper's failure to supply a room. The approaching arrival of his infant son would have been a logical, convincing argument in both cases. We have no record that Joseph spoke up on the behalf of his family. Nor did Joseph voice his anger or his suspicions when Mary told him of her pregnancy. Some would take Joseph's silence as an evidence of weakness. I tend to think his acceptance of his circumstances testified to his strength. The greatest testament to a person's strong character is often a half-severed tongue resulting from that person biting it so much. Any dentist would have seen the signs upon his examinations of Joseph's mouth. Mary, too, was a person who kept her feelings to herself most of the time. She had good reason to object when some uninvited male guests barged into the delivery room, also known as a stable, bringing their smelly, noisy animals with them, but she said nothing. The downside of not speaking is that it gives others room to put words in your mouth. If Mary had spoken, I can imagine her saying something like this, Enough with all the commotion! I understand who my baby is and what he will one day do and why you are all here. But for now, please allow me to just quietly bask in the moment with my husband and my son. 
The birth of a child is an experience that couples and their families excitedly anticipate. I feel sorry for those who have become mothers during the pandemic. Like others who have gone through other life-threatening or life-altering medical events this year, those mothers gave birth without the presence or support of their loved ones. In many cases, no family member was there to calm their fears, hold their hand, or show them the child for the very first time. Mary had anticipated this child more than most mothers do. Her son was also God's son. That fact had previously led to a quiet woman bursting forth in praise. In the presence of God and Elizabeth, her relative, Mary said these words, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. Luke 1, 46-48 Realizing how blessed you are tends to elevate your praise and quiet your complaints. On the night of Jesus' birth, Mary could have used some quiet time with just her husband and her son. She would have it soon enough. For now, she permitted the noise as she sat there quietly. Her quietness was partially because she was considering what it all meant. Luke 2.19 says this, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them, pondered them in her heart. The scene around the manger was one of the most serene there has ever been. I do not know exactly what that scene looked like. I doubt it was like the scenes that you might see in a movie. Scenes for which there is no adequate explanation often get encapsulated in songs. One of the relatively newer ones that tries to capture what might have been going through Mary's mind is the song, Mary, Did You Know? It's a beautiful song. It may be one of your favorites. Another favorite about that night is the one that you learned as a child, Away in a Manger. It was written in 1887. That is an old song, but not so old and not even as endearing as one that first appeared in a novel in, 1960, in 1860. The novel's title was Say and Seal. In it, a young girl lay dying. Her comfort in that moment came as someone read her the words to a poem entitled, Jesus Loves Me. You know the song. You have sung it since you were a child. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Most people think of that song as a children's song. But it talks about a timeless truth that covers you from before when you were born until after you die. Recently, I ran across a version of the song that relates more closely to the latter stages of a person's life. It says this, Jesus loves me, this I know, though my hair is white as snow. Though my sight is growing dim, still he bids me trust in him. Though my steps are oh so slow, with my hand in his I'll go. On through life, let come what may, he'll be there to lead the way. Though I am no, young, no longer young, I have much which he's begun. Let me serve Christ with a smile. Go with others the extra mile. When the nights are dark and long, in my heart he puts a song, telling me in words so clear, have no fear, for I am near. When my work on earth is done and life's victories have been won, he will take me home above 
then I'll understand his love. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus' family did not speak. They did not need to. Jesus' presence said it all. The message of Christmas is that God has come to live among men because of his love for us. Love was the unspoken message of the manger. It was a silent night. It was a holy night. Always calm, always bright. There was a formerly round young virgin, now a mother and her child. He was the holy infant, so tender and mild. All his mother wanted was for him to sleep in heavenly peace. The day would come for him to speak. He was the word, after all. But for now, he could sleep in heavenly peace on this silent, holy night. Yes, this year has been noisy. If the Grinch were a real character, he would have been offended long ago and would currently be making uh, preparations for removing all these noisemakers from our world. We might even welcome him this year. He could not be any worse than the other villains that 2020 has produced. Christmas itself is usually noisy, but it will be quieter this year. Less people will gather around the tree as you open your presents, and Christmas parties are largely curtailed. Though the tradition of caroling through the neighborhood has long since dwindled, this year has given it a death blow. Churches would normally be full today, the Sunday before Christmas. Many of them, like ours, since him, sits empty. Not everything is silent. We can still say Merry Christmas to each other with the same gusto that George Bailey showed, even if we must limit it to well wishes to a car, through a card, a phone call, or an electronic message, or even yelling it across the street. We can still sing along to the radio on our favorite Christmas songs. And hopefully you have drowned out this preacher on our Facebook broadcast today. While we miss much of the sounds associated with Christmas, their absence is not a bad thing in all cases. Silence, though uncomfortable to many, enables you to hear things you might have otherwise missed. The world's voices are still speaking. They surround you with megawatted noise. God, too, is still speaking. To hear him requires stillness. That is why scripture says, Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes God fills the nighttime sky with an angelic choir, as in Hark the Herald Angels Sing. God will also use the praise from shepherds to wake you from your deep and dreamless sleep, as spoken of in a little town of Bethlehem. But most of the time, God speaks in the quietness of a manger with a still, small voice. Listen for his voice this Christmas as he says, I love you. Do you hear what I hear? Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you so much for the babe in the manger. Because without that, there could not have been a king on the cross. Thank you for all that it is you've given, but most of all, thank you for your gift of Jesus. And I pray that we will give worship, honor, and glory, but also our voices this Christmas as we sing our praises to you, but also tell it on the mountain to people who need to hear. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us this morning. If I've raised some issue that you would like to talk with me about, please send me a message and I'll be glad to communicate with you, whether, whether it be on the phone, electronically, or even in person if you would like, and sharing the message of Jesus Christ, his hope and joy and the meaning that he provides. Don't forget about our Christmas Eve service coming up this Thursday at 5 o'clock in the parking lot of our church and would encourage you to be part of that, although we do. I want to wish each and every one of you a Merry Christmas for me and my family, um, to each of you. 
Share this message with others. If you got here late, go back to the beginning so you can see some of the things that we talked about there. Remember that there will be no evening Bible studies this week, but we again, we will have the service on Thursday night, the Christmas Eve service at the church at 5 o'clock. We love you. Once again, I want to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas. Hope to see you very soon. What do you say?